but I think it's okay. Yeah, they're not just fine. Just one slide with that suit, but the part was so. Uh, Thank you. We started. Okay. Okay, we can start. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second meeting of the Belgrade Legal Theory Group meeting within the Alp Belgrade Legal Philosophy Week that lasts from the 13th until the 18th of November. So, my name is Maria, and I'm um, going to be moderating this today's meeting where we have the honor to host. Uh, uh, the lecturer, Professor Dominguez Farino, am I correct? Thank you very much. So, having in mind that this year's Alps Belgrade Legal Philosophy Week is dedicated to the very relevant, very hot and trendy topic also, but also very important, and that is artificial intelligence, we have the honor now to listen a little bit more about the AI, the, the, the connection of the AI to the European Union law and European Union regulations. And um, I would just say, before I give the word and give the floor to Professor Farino, I would just say a few words about our lecturer for today. So, uh, Professor Farino is uh, also the assistant professor at the University of Lisbon School of Law. He is a senior researcher of the Lisbon Public Law Research Center, where he coordinates Lisbon Digital Rights and Freedoms Research Group. His main areas of research are administrative law, uh, especially EU regul regulatory law, so we will have now the opportunity to listen more about that, fundamental rights, mainly privacy and data protection, and legal theory as well. So he's also a legal consultant working in the field of TMT and digital public law. Uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to Professor Farino, and I would like to thank you again for participating, because coming from an ALF partner, a partner institution, we are very happy to host you again here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It uh, will save me a lot of time uh, further on. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for the invitation also, um, especially to Boyan, Boy, which, which I had the uh, uh, the pleasure of meeting in Lisbon, and I, which I also ruined his uh, stay at the at uh, at the city. But we will talk about that later, not now. Um, and I, of course, thank you all to be here in attendance. I'm pretty much overwhelmed, not only because I see a, a lot of people on the screen, but also all of you here. Um, and so, thank you very much. I hope that you find my my talk uh, a little bit interesting. Uh, so you have the, the title on, on the screen. Uh, before I start, I would like to lose some one or two minutes uh, giving you a picture of my background because this not only will help you to understand, I think, better what I have to say, but will also probably tend to the disappointment that you may feel when I sometimes derive from legal theory more into the fields of digital law or administrative law. So I... Uh, I apologize in advance. And that is because, like it was so well presented, I actually came to uh, legal theory uh, almost 10 years ago from the field of uh, administrative law, regulatory law, fundamental rights. I, I work about basically at the intersection of this, these areas until now and digital law. And at the time, I felt that there was, there was a lot of confusion, especially because the topic was new. Uh, and there had to be some way to start, try to uh, solve that those confusions I was finding in much of the legal uh, language and legal work I was finding on digital law and regulatory law. And uh, uh, Lisbon Legal Theory Group had just been uh, funded, founded, and so it was uh, like a, a meeting of souls when I found that one of my best friends and colleagues, David Duarte, which will be probably very quoted during my presentation, um, was actually had actually created the group on legal theory, and basically my approach is that of I am very much interested in two areas traditional to, to legal theory, which is norm individuation and interpretation, theory of interpretation, and I found that an, an analytical approach to these two areas, both norm individuation, I'll be talking about in a bit, and interpretation, and I'll, I'll also be talking about interpretation on Saturday. So there's. Uh, uh, you have to listen to me twice, I'm sorry, um, but more on that later. So basically, just for you to understand that sometimes I won't be so interested in the legal theory foundations of these two issues, norm individuation and interpretation, but how, and this is my topic for today, how we can use that in um, digital law. 
So basically, as I was saying, uh, you know the title of my presentation. I chose uh, Hoffeld. Uh, has, has anyone here not heard of Hoffeld before? So anyone, everyone knows Hoffeld. If, if not, just speak now. Okay, so one person. That's not bad. That's good, actually, probably. Uh, and who has read the IIAC proposal from the European Union? Everyone? I, prior to your arrival. <laughs> So most of the people have heard of uh, Offil, but they have not read the AI Act. So you are on the right side of the on the light side of the force. Uh, it would be awful if it were the other way around. And I'm going to try to show why. So the idea to to take an Ophelian uh, approach uh, or the Ophelian scheme as a as a paradigm to look at the AI Act came to me before, uh, if any one of you, and I, I just asked them, fortunately, not that many, if any one of you has read the AI Act, it's a nightmare of uh, normative proposition. It's, uh, it's very awful, it's uh, say the least. And so one of the problems you have when you're trying to deal with the proposal, trying to come up with ways to interpret the proposal is, of course, normative evaluation, because there's a lot of redundancy, there's a lot of antinomies in the, in the, in the text while you're trying to figure out what uh, norms you can uh, take out of it. And also there's a lot of problems regarding what exactly are the legal positions that come out of the AI Act. So of course, I remember Hoffel. And for those of you, only apparently only one person <laughs> that do not know about Hoffel schemes, uh, we'll go into that in a bit, but the idea is um, that's probably the most important reason why Hoffel is, is known, is that Hoffel proposed a scheme of uh, Euro relations basically explaining that uh, you can look at uh, legal rules, um, legal norms, and uh, from the geontic modalities of those, of those norms, you can build a scheme of euro relations. And uh, euro relations are, for that reason, very interesting in, uh, as, a, as a tool to do norm individuation because they give you a setup to look at rules in, and tell you what you should be looking at when you're looking into to a, a normative statement in the law. But it's also very important for a second reason that I'll be addressing at the end of my talk, which is they connect highly with uh, something that uh, uh, that Bulligan and al uh, did a lot of work in, uh, which is implicit rules, which is kind of like one of the main reasons why we do what we do is that if it were only the act of reading normative text and come up coming out on the other side with rules, that would be, I would say, not very easy, but easy. Uh, the thing is, there are a lot of even implicit rules in the systems. And actually, I think awful one of the, the, the main functions that the schemes perform is that it uh, directs your attention to the finding of implicit rules. Why? Because let's take an example. Actually, we can move on to that. Uh, to that, this is, of course, the very famous uh, Ophelian uh, scheme. This is from the, the 1919 the definitive edition, let's call it like that, but it was actually put forth in 1913. And uh, for example, if you take the, the, the pair that I will be most addressing today, which is right and duty, which is a, a correlative or euro relation, uh, why is it interesting for uh, the notion of implicit rules? If you have a normative text that allows you to extract a duty, for instance, uh, an obligation that says, for example, AI systems providers must register the system they are, um, they are um, providing to the, to the market. If you have this rule, which is a, you can extract from the text, a very clear cut rule, so there's a, an entity that has uh, an obligation to register a certain uh, type of technology, what Hoffel tells you is that, well, if there's a duty that, is a drug that has a, a, prim as a primary addressee, uh, the provider, then there must be a secondary addressee that by that very fact, we'll, be, we'll talk to that, about that in a moment, as a secondary addressee, as a claim right to the fulfillment of the duty. So uh, providers have to register AI systems and someone in the legal system has a claim right to compel the uh, compel or to, we'll, we'll go into that later, but to compel or to um, claim to another entity to uh, supervise or enforce the fulfillment of the obligation or the duty. So there's 
And that th this rule, of course, is hidden. It's implicit in this. It may or maybe not, but usually it is. So the, the legislator is worried about the duty. Uh, it states, however it is under the nat natural language, uh, a certain text. You extract the duty from that text. You come out with an explicit duty, but there's an implicit claim right uh, associated to it. So that's the, the other reason why I think uh, the Ophelian schemes are interesting. So basically, to, to move on, we are going to use Offeld's um, uh, scholarship in two ways. First, we're going, we're going to use the, the, the Ophelian scheme. Uh, we are focusing on correlatives, as I, as I as it's stated in, on, on the slide. And why is that? Because correlatives are very important, as I just mentioned, to uncover implicit rules. Because they, uh, what comes out of the text, and I, I would say that probably 90-90% of the the literature that has been written on Hoffeld since the 1919 or 1913 um, paper has been on what does it mean to be uh, to be in a euro correlative relationship. And awful basically, we're going to work with this very simple definition. Uh, a correlative means a necessary implication on the on the sense that I just explained. So if someone has a duty, uh, awful says that on the other side there's um, there's a right. And of course, you can criticize this. I'm going to use the, the original Offeld scheme. Uh, for example, a colleague of mine, David Duarte, has just published a paper in which he said that the privilege, no right, correlative euro relationship is wrong. Uh, so there's a, a lot of other authors that defend uh, minor or major corrections to the to the, the Offeldian scheme. For example, David says that uh, privilege, which will also be called, actually, it will mostly be called during my talk, uh, a liberty. That's most of the, the literature now calls it that. And even Offeld calls the privilege a, a, a liberty. Um, uh, David says that you can't have a no right as the, the, the dual correlative of, of a privilege because a, a, a freedom is a, a permission. A permission has a twofold deontic modality. It can be a permission to or a permission not to. And the no right does not correspond in a necessary implication to that. That does not cover all the, 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 the modalities of deontic operators that you could implicate in the no right of a permission. But that's completely out of the scope of my talk. Uh, what I mean to carry on from this to the next point is uh, we're going to use the, the Ophelian scheme and we are going to focus on just one piece of the Ophelian scheme, which is the correlative real, real relationship. That's, that's the part I'm interested in today. So, okay. I promised I would be talking about the AI Act from a, a regulatory perspective. Uh, so let's uh, try to sum up what that means. Uh, first of all, a first disclaimer, which I, I'm using not the current version because God only knows that no one knows what's the current version of the IAC proposal. So I'm using the only one that has been published uh, formally. That is the version of uh, April 2021. Uh, I, remind, I remind you that we are now in 2023. So you might be wondering why I'm using a very outdated version. But the thing is, if you do a fairly extensive um, search on the internet for the current version, you don't know what's the current version because there is the version of the European Parliament over this version. Uh, there are some minor uh, uh, changes already discussed by the council, but which are not formally adopted. So actually no one quite knows. The other option for me would be to use the version that actually is published in the European Parliament uh, website, which is a comparative version between this one and the amendments proposed by Parliament. But the truth is we don't know if the, those amendments are going to pass the trilogue between the three uh, EU institutions. So I think um, this version works. And also this version uh, allows me to make a very important point. If this version is so nightmarish, any other modification on it, it's what, knowing the bureaucracy in the EU is going to make it worse and not better. So this is a very good version to work on. Um, another point I want to make uh, before we move on to the main course is that uh, when talking about regulation, I'll be using two notions of regulation. One, of course, that can be pretty much confused or identified with most of what we call the law. So regulation, in a sense, is uh, any rules pertaining to regulate actions. So if uh, you do, you say that I'm going to regulate that, well, that's what the law does. If you're talking about, of course, about regulatory rules, not constitutive rules, but that's another uh, discussion out completely out of my, of my topic. But the idea is that 
we can look at the IIF proposal in, as a normative text of legislative origin and say, okay, so this is a regulation. This regulates actions of a lot of, as we're going to see further on, of a lot of uh, legal subjects. And in a sense, that is interesting because that allows us to perform one of the actions that I think Offal Offal can uh, help us with, which is to make some, uh, I would say, make something clear out of the confusion that uh, the AI Act normative text is. The second dimension, this will be the last part of my talk, is a, the regulation in a, in a narrow sense. Uh, of course, uh, after the first um, uh, sense, you can have a lot of narrower sense depending on the perspective and the set of criteria that you use. I'm using the criteria that and that, that's why I tried to explain where I, where I came from and where I come from, my background. My usual perspective in, when I talk about regulation is what we could call public administrative, administrative uh, regulation, which is a very specific kind of regulation, which is you have the broad sense regulation, that, that is you have rules usually enacted by a legislator, but we could use that even, for example, under customary law. But then because of the way that the rules are made in that specific case, because they allow discretion to whomever has to uh, uphold those rules, public administrations have a lot of discretion. So basically they have discretion to enact further rules, not legal ones, but administrative ones, and they have discretion to apply the law uh, through very specific acts that we usually call in the, the continental tradition, administrative acts, where again they, have, they exercise a lot of discretion because the antecedent, of course, allows for that, or the stipulation of the rule allows for that. And that, of course, presents another set of problems, which is to uh, know very well what uh, that degree or that spectrum of discretion is. And that is another huge problem in the AI Act proposal, not only because it's very difficult to understand where public administration discretion ends and uh, where uh, self-regulatory discretion begins, but also because the effective powers, to, to, to use an Ophelian um, term, that are foreseen for uh, what we could call the public administration under the IAC proposal are very diverse. And if we do not do a very rigorous assessment of uh, both the rules and the legal positions that they uh, confer, that they foresee, we are lost in a kind of regulatory uh, high C. Okay? So, and, uh, the point, point two three of this slide basically sums up what I've been saying. This presents two kinds of problems that I'm very much interested in, in doing research on, which is norm individuation on one side and dealing with discretion and discretion here in the sense that it convokes two of the, the interesting problems, which is interpretation versus adjudication. Is it the same thing? Is it not? Uh, we can move on. So this is another caveat before we, okay. Just moving on. I think okay. yeah. perfect. <laughs> okay, so a final, uh, not a certain, not a caveat, but the final um, announcement has to do, and especially directed at those who fortunately have not read the Act proposal, just to give you a broad picture of what to expect. Uh, now that I'm going to dive deep into the, into the, into the AI Act proposal. So basically, for those of you who do not know what's the proposal of the Commission and what is being discussed. Uh, the, the approach to regulation, uh, to regulate uh, AI in the EU is a, a risk-based approach. Basically, that probably you have heard about because it's the, the, the hype one in the European Union. Uh, and the, this uh, risk-based approach has four tiers or four levels. So basically, there's one tier, which is the forbidden AI system. So you basically, you can't have those uh, AI systems. I'll not be dealing with those in depth because from a, an Ophelian perspective, that's very simple. There's a, a rule uh, forbidding uh, AI systems, so that's pretty much it. So Offal wouldn't have much to say on that. Um, then you have the high risk system. This is where is the, the bulk of the AI Act proposal is. is most of the chapters uh, and most of the titles of the AI regulation deal with this. And this is where the, we'll start descending into hell uh, in, a, in a few moments. Then you have the medium risk IA. This is very good for those that don't want to lose much time with AI Act because Title Four, basically, I think one uh, article of the of the AI Act proposal covers medium uh, risk AI um, systems. And then you have the no risk, as I sometimes find it in the literature, which is of course not completely correct 
it's a no risk AI system from the perspective of the scope of the proposal. Because of course, for example, if that system, which is not covered by the AI Act, has some problem dealing with personal data, of course, it's a, a risk from the perspective of, of the GDPR and you, of course, will be able to invoke GDPR at going against the provider of that AI system. So of course, when we mention, and I will be saying that probably a lot of times today, when, when, I'll, when I'll say, or when we'll discuss no risk systems, uh, it follows that it's a no risk system under the AI proposal. That doesn't mean it's a no risk system and there are any other um, a law regulation of uh, the EU. So uh, that's that. And of course, uh, the conclusion is, of course, that when we get to the final point of my talk, which is administrative regulation, so the narrower scope uh, uh, problem of regulation, this, of course, entails different kinds of regulations. For example, uh, for me, the NIA has a very uh, uh, exiguous scope of regulation because the only thing that, uh, as we're going to see in a while, the national supervisors have to do is that the forbidden IA rests, keeps forbidden. So there's no, uh, no one violating that. So they don't have to do much. Okay, so now for the main course, this was just the appetizers to get you in the mood for, of course, if you're going to do a Orpheus thing in the Descent to Hell, might as well have some music with it. So now let's start. Now, this is on purpose for you not to read. So don't, don't, uh, don't be, if you get to read Article 16, which I repeat in a, a wider font, that's all right. So imagine that the, the AI Act was as simple as Article 16. Now, Article 16 of the AI Act is pretty much um, the executive summary of the AI Act. So if you had to do what, what's going to happen uh, after the AI Act is enacted, and you know, of course, what I just said, that you have forbidden uh, AI systems and you have minimum risk AI systems, you have those systems that are not considered at all, you would get the AI, the, the high risk AI systems. And this is what Article 16 says from an Ophelian perspective. So if you look at this, uh, there's the shell uh, word, which usually indicates uh, a deontic operator. So um, it says, and I, have, I really have to read this article, I apologize in advance. So ensure that their high risk AI systems are compliant with the requirements set out in chapter two. So the first obligation in uh, letter A is to actually send you, send everyone, uh, the providers, to a chapter which as we shall see has an abundance of normative texts. It's chaotic. We shall see that in a moment because I'm not gonna spare you to that. We're going to see every, every well, most of them actually. So you have letter B, have a quality management system which complies with Article 7, draw up technical documentation of the high-risk AI system, then when under their control, keep logs automatically generated by their high-risk AI systems, ensure that the high-risk AI system undergoes the relevant conformity assessment procedure. Another feature, I would say probably the most important feature in the system, in the, the scope of the AI Act, uh, then, of course, comply with the registration obligations. Actually, I gave that as an example a while back. Take the necessary corrective actions if the AI, risk, AI system um, is not in conformity. Inform the national competent authorities of member states in which they made the AI system available or put into service and where applicable the notified body of the non-compliance and any corrective actions taken. To affix, and this is very important, don't forget this one, to affix the C marking, so if there's no C in the system, that's a problem. And finally, and very important, this connects with my the final part of my talk, upon request of a national competent authority, demonstrate the conformity of the high risk AI system uh, with the requirements laid out in chapter two. So even if we didn't read any other provision in the AI Act, we know now that we have a chapter two full of nice and wonderful obligations that we're going to, um, uh, address some sort of legal subjects that the AI Act call the operators. We'll see that in a while. Um, and besides that, there's this menu of other obligations that usually entail that you read some other set of provisions to understand. So this, just Article 16 is chaos. For you to, from an Ophelian perspective, if you would like to know exactly uh, what legal positions are until here, you could say, well, their duties, but exactly what duties they are, it's not very clear. I mean, it's duties that you could state from a very general perspective, but not other than that. And that's exactly what an analytical approach wants to avoid. It wants to reconstruct the system to have 
to individuate specific rules, to understand if they're redundant with each other, if they're contrary to each other. And Article 16 basically shows that the, the EU legislator is very much at ease with uh, repeating rules. For example, one case is have a quality management system in place which complies with Article 17. And if you read Article 70, it says that you have to have a quality management system. So basically, there are two uh, normative provisions saying the exact same thing. Just one is more detailed than the other, which is Article 17, but you already have that duty under Article 16, letter C. So it's, like I said, an Ophelian uh, nightmare, but it's also the reason why Ophelian, Ophelian schemes are very relevant. So now we're going to pass in review. I'm going to do this a little bit faster than I wanted because I seem like very nice people and I want, don't want to torture you. But at the same time, I want to show you that I did a lot of work. So imagine what the, the work we're do, doing now. Uh, if you went uh, completely uh, far out with uh, the Ophelian approach that I'm proposing, you would take, I would say, this is, what, almost, this is probably almost what I, where it took me, two days to individuate every rule in the area proposed. This is two days working, I would say, eight hours. So you would have to read through all the area proposal and do the Ophelian proposal, which is individu individuate norms to get atomistic. I didn't use that word until now and I forgot. Uh, to use the atomistic promise of the Ophelian scheme, which is if you do this right, there are no other possibilities other than the legal position you just, you just found, which correlates to a specific legal rule. Um, and now we can move on. So I'm going to show you not all, I'm not going to do this, if not, we'll, we'll be ending this session by tomorrow at my, more or less this time, or actually the day after tomorrow, more or less this time. Uh, what I chose to do is a kind of balance between torturing you a little bit and showing you the most important rules that we can come up in, in legal positions that we can draw from an Ophelian perspective. So at the top of the slide that we're now going to see, you're going to see two information that are important from an Ophelian perspective. First, where is the normative text where you can take the rule out and where you can uh, justify the legal position from an Ophelian perspective? When there is some sort of problem from an Ophelian perspective, usually there is in bold and italic. So I uh, dwell on that a little bit more than, than usual. Uh, and also I say, who are the primary addressees? Mm -hmm. Okay. And other than that, at the very top, uh, you have the secondary or the correlative euro position, which begs the question that I will only address at the end of my talk, which is, who is the secondary addressee to the, cor the correlative dual position. For, so, for example, in this case, we are beginning with obligations, so duties addressed as primary addressees to providers and manufacturers through Article 24. If you have a duty addressed uh, to providers, you will have a claim right as a correlative of Feldian euro relationship. And the question I want you to be able to uh, discuss with me later on, and I will try to address that one, which is for me one of the main, most important and interesting aspects of, of an Ophelian perspective uh, on this topic, which is who is the secondary addressee to that claim right? So if I ask, would ask you now, if we have a duty of providers to, for example, uh, implement a risk assessment system, so Article 9.1, coming from Article 9.1, who has the claim right to guarantee uh, the enforcement of the risk assessment system by the provider. So that's that's for us to answer later on. So on this first slide, we have uh, providers and manufacturers. So the nightmare continues. Uh, it's not only providers, but there's a provision that says, well, in manufacturers too, which is another kind of addressee to the rules, because manufacturers are not in the sense of the IAC the same thing as providers. Providers are those that um, uh, make available the AI system in the market, so to a general public. Manufacturers are just those that manufacture in a very simple sense. So I can manufacture AI system, for example, in my university. I don't put it on the market, but I did manufacture it. And later on, for example, five years on, I think it's ready to go to the market. And instead of putting it on the market, I sell it or, or I give it away to the provider. It's the provider that puts it on the market. So it's not exactly the same thing. The EU legislator knows this. So to solve this problem, because it doesn't want to uh, dwell on that too long, it says, well, 
that's going to apply the, the exact same uh, legal provisions to manufacturers sue Article 24, which is an extension extension norm, not very uh, complicated. So. If we look at this, let's focus, because you were reading the same thing as me, let's focus on the italics and the bold, that's what's interesting. So one thing that's very interesting, and it's like a counterfactual to a, a, an Ophelian perspective, is if you look at Article 13.1, the duty to ensure transparency. It's one of the few cases where the legislator, I would say he did, he did this uh, completely oblivious, uh, where he actually makes an implicit secondary addressee explicit in the normative text, which allows you to say that you have an explicit rule regarding the secondary advocacy. Because if you read Article 13.1 of the proposal, the duty to ensure transparency, the normative text, and then the norm that you can extract for it, says that the reason why you have to ensure transparency is to give the natural persons the ability to interpret AI's uh, output. So this is a very good example of a case, a counterfactual to my claim, that usually, and this is, I think, uh, very easy to understand, usually the legislator, of course, is not worried about OFO, usually doesn't even know that OFO exists or existed. Uh, it just writes something and enacts it. And uh, sometimes it does something in the lines of what OFO would do, which is to make, make explicit both the primary addressee and the secondary addressee of the juror relations that awful uh, exposed. So basically here is one of the few examples, and this is uh, one of the first uh, things I would like to stress when going through the, the, the list of Feldian positions, where the legislature does that. And this confirms that if this only happens, on, at least on this slide, on Article 13.1, uh, we have to do the work, this is analytical work, that to uncover the rules, the implicit rules that come out of the secondary addressees uh, positions. So, and what, the other point I, would, I wanted to make with this slide is just uh, the font is very small. There's a lot of legal obligations there. And if you're ready for those, then you're ready for the next five slides. Uh, the difference is the font is going to get smaller. Okay, so here we continue. So I just want to stress this point. We covered Article 8 to 14, and now we're going to cover Article 15 to 62, 1. And we are still in the same list of primary addressees. So this is providers and manufacturers. Uh, I don't want to spoil, but uh, the number of addressees of the AAC proposal um, is a two digit number. So let's think about that. So this is just providers and manufacturers. Uh, okay, what we have here. Here I want to stress Article 43.1. Uh, and this is the problem of conformity assessment. Why, why do I want to talk about this? Two reasons. And this is one of our very subjective opinion, not very analytical. I would say that if you, I had to choose a core of the AI proposal, it's the, the conformity assessment. If you, uh, this, is not, this is not my point today, but how am I on time? Well, you have a kind of your 10-ish. Ten, ten ten okay, you have to speed up. Okay, so the conformity assessment is basically, if you're looking at the AI proposal from a regulatory perspective, basically an administrative law pers uh, regulatory perspective, is basically the heart of the law because of the proposal, because the conformity assessment can either be done uh, alone by the providers or manufacturers, so basically they read the law into a conformity assessment, that's the only way they can put an AI system on the market, or they do it through someone that we'll meet in a while, but I, I can tell you in advance, called the notified bodies. So notified bodies are other private subjects that are given a kind of uh, authorization to do conformity assessments. And again, up until this point, the only minor presence of a public administrative authority is that there is a notifying body, so don't confuse notified body with notifying authority, there's a notifying authority that actually authorizes a conformity assessment body that then becomes a notified body. So the EU not only makes bad law, but makes very bad language, which is also law. Um, and why is it the conformity assessment at the heart? Because basically, if you fail the conformity assessment, you can't put your AI system in the market. So basically, it, it, it's the, the leverage of the, of the AI proposal. You either do this right, or you can't do any AI in the European Union. Um, and notice 
that although this is at the heart of the AI Act, at least on my opinion, and this is the second note I would like to make, it's just a drop in the ocean of obligation. So even if you do the conformity assessment right, and we're going to see in a while, it is a very high discretion uh, procedure, you still have to comply with all those duties that you saw uh, on the previous slide and with all those duties that you are seeing now. Okay, let's move on. And now you have uh, new uh, addresses, new primary addresses. You have importers and distributors. So these are not providers and manufacturers. These are people that did not make um, the AI system. They are not putting it on the market in their country. At least they are either bringing the AI system to the market or they, someone else did, the importer, and they are just distribu distributing in on their market. And again, uh, the point I want to stress or the two points I want to stress is that you here have now for the first time at least sequentially in the AI proposal, a duty to provide national competent authorities with necessary information. So this is the first time you have a duty that makes you wonder if the secondary addressee is really, for example, natural persons, or is in fact uh, uh, public authorities, national authorities. So this is a rule that will later on be able to discuss in further detail because here is a duty that seems to identify the secondary addressee, or at least raising the doubt of the secondary addressee is um, national authorities and not, as you, I think we would think, uh, natural persons. And then uh, another rule that, or another provision that stresses this, uh, this doubt is Article 27.4, the duty to inform national competent authorities of risk at national level. So these two, uh, duties seem to have as a secondary addressee the idea that I have a duty to this and the national authorities would have the claim right to ask for uh, the necessary information. Let's see if this is right or if we're reading off or wrong. I think we are, but uh, we're, uh, we'll talk about that in a while. And late, I'm, I'm not going to stress this, but it's in bold in italics. So I just want to explain why. There's another extension done by the legislator. It's at the very end of the, of the slide. I'm not going to get to that. Okay, so another set of addresses. So here are users. So duties of users. What are users? Uh, basically, users are the entities, usually companies or public administration that use commercially or for, for public reason um, accounts, use the AI, the, the AI system, sorry. Um, and so users have a set of their own duties. For example, they have to use AI according to instructions. They have to monitor the operation of AI. So here there's not anything else I would like to stress unless there's a relatively small set of duties, but there's another operator. There's another uh, addressee, which means that we are doubling. And anytime we find another primary addressee, there's the promise that we might be finding another secondary addressee or repeating a previous one, but that's something that we also cover later. Okay, now if we begin to get what I want, I'm going to speed up this part, but basically I just want to stress that uh, we now come to the addressees that I'm more into investigating and doing research on, which are member states, because of course they are the legislator, and uh, the national competent authorities. And bear in mind that for the AI Act proposal, this is the legal definition under the AI Act proposal, national competent authorities entail two different things. The market surveillance authority, then actually three different things. The notifying authority and the national competent authority. And I'm quoting, this is, I'm not making names up. So basically when the AI Act says there's a national supervisory authority, it's talking about three different entities. But then you have a very interesting rule that says these three different things are to do just one institution under EU law. So it's basically chaotic again. The law says you have three different authorities in the law, but then there's a rule saying you can only have one institution where the three converge. That's, it's crazy. Uh, okay, we can move on from that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm going to speed up. So here we have notified bodies and conformity assessment bodies. So they're a different kind of addressee. Then you have the commission. She hadn't sh showed up yet, of course you had to have the commission. And then we go on to another 
uh, legal position on the off-field scheme, prohibitions. As you can see, prohibitions are not very much in fashion in the Act proposal. There's a few of them, but they're very important, of course. And then we come up to uh, liberties, which are actually not very much in fashion either. And let's end with, of course, my favorite ones, which is the duality, the euro relation between power and liability. From the perspective of what I'm talking about today, although power is a very important uh, legal position for the IAC, because if you want to do an investigation on what is the regulatory public perspective of the IAC, of course, you have to look to powers. The counter or the, the correlative euro position is very simple to understand, and they're not, they're not very difficult to um, identify, which is what often called the liability. So if you are, uh, if there is a public administrative body that has some sort of power to change the legal system, then of course there has to be someone that is liable to the exercise of that power. So for example, if I am, uh, say, the director of a uh, Portuguese government agency, and I enact an administrative act licensing, for example, uh, some, uh, for example, energy power plants. Of course, there's going to be someone liable to my act, to their, their, the conditions and the requisites I'm going to enact in that authorization. So that's easy to understand. What I want to stress, because I want to move on to the, my closing remarks, is that there's a high degree, the only uh, legal positions under the Ophelian scheme that compare to duties are powers. You can see them here, and you can see them here. Uh, so there is very, a lot of them, okay? Um, and this allows us to, then to move on to, uh, to my final remarks. Okay, so basically I have two final points, which are very much shorter than these ones. I have, like I said, tortured you enough. Now we are ascending from hell. So we've been through hell and now we are ascending. And I want to go to points four and five to do some concluding remarks. So what comes out of the IAC proposal that we could call a regulatory, an administrative regulatory framework? So very quickly. Um, one is that we can say that uh, there's a very first presence of public administration called the notifying body, like I mentioned. So I'm going to move faster on this one. So there's a public administrative agency that is going to be qualified, certified by a member state or by each member state saying, you are a notifying body. What does the notifying authority does? The not notifying authority certificates that some private company can do conformity assessments. So there is, that's its function. This is a public body that is in charge of assessing the ones that are going to do conformity assessments. Other than this, when the AI system is already, has already undergone the conformity assessment, it is operating usually in the market, then you have the National Supervisory Authority. Like I said, it's the same institution because the AI proposed sets have to be the same institution, but legally it's a different body. It has a different name with different powers, like we saw uh, in the previous slides. So basically, and this is more for the administrative uh, fans in the, in the room, you have something on the lines which is very dear to the European uh, Union law of the, what you call it under German law, uh, the, um, the regulated self uh administrative system uh, in German law, which is basically you create a system of self-regulation and then you make up a public body that regulates the entity that controls the self-regulation. And this is very similar to that. So you basically put the market regulating itself through the notified bodies that do the conformity assessments. And then you have two public administration bodies, one that does an ex ante control, another that does an ex post control that does the regulation over the self regulation of the market. So this is nothing new if you know a little bit of your German basic administrative law. And to finish some analytical remarks and my three claims on the Ophelian merits uh, of the AI Act proposal. I've saved one of my favorite slides for last. Uh, I didn't even want to give it number one. I think it's zero point. It's four zero. It's the only time this happens in the presentation. This is the ecosystem of the act proposal from a subjective perspective. So there are 17 norm addresses in the act proposal. If this is not chaotic and crazy, 
I don't know what it is. So all these uh, entities that are there are legal subjects under the EU law system and of course by derivation under the EU member states law systems. And they are all addressees either primarily or secondarily of the AI Act proposal. So basically, if you want to carry out completely the work uh, proposed or allowed by the Ophelian scheme, you have to come up with rules and then the corresponding legal positions to all of those 17 um, operators and legal subjects. Okay, my three claims and very fast because the time is running. So I think the Ophelian schemes are very good for interpreting nightmares and the IAC proposal is a nightmare. So that's the first thing. It's, it's a very modest conclusion, but actually it's my favorite one. So if you are in the middle of, for, for some reason that uh, uh, deserves our collective pity in the necessity of having to deal and to live with the act proposal and later on with the act as an enacted law of the European Union, which is probably not the most okay, not the case in, with most of you here in the room. It's my case. Um, Offeld will come to your help, and you, if you do an Offeldian scheme approach, you'll probably start the chaos out. Of course, you'll be a little bit more gray-haired, but that's the price to pay. Also, it's very good on what I'm will be talking on Saturday, which is my favorite topic when we deal with interpretation. It's, it's the problem of the frontier between. Uh, semantic or I'm um, sorry, language and meta language approaches to theories of interpretation, which is we can sum up with three uh, uh, words ambiguity, indeterminacy, and open texture in the natural language used by the legal provisions. And this is again very helpful if you use an Ophelden perspective because the atomicity in the approach of the Ophelden perspective makes you look at ambiguities from a very narrow point of view. So you narrow the ambiguity, so to speak. Of course, you don't solve it. It's not a, a magic wand, but it helps you to better solve the problem. I'll address that on Saturday uh, from a, a, an analytical perspective. And also, it also, uh, to come, to come, come full circle, also, if you do the two-day approach that Offworld allows you, you will come up to a, what we could call a reconstructed AI act, which is, for example, there are many authors, of course, um, doing this, but I will go to Alshavon and Bulligan again. Uh, you have a reconstructed analytical AI act, which is, I would say, uh, completely uh, deprived of redundancies and antinomies and the sorts, and so you can use it better. I have two more slides, just. Okay, so the second aspect I mentioned it is my second claim. Um, Dural correlatives allow you to determine implicit norms. And now is the time to answer my, my question at the beginning, who are the addressees of both duties and uh, powers in the AI proposal? To me, it seems clear that the addressees of the, um, of the, the obligations, the duties under the AI proposal are natural persons. And this is where I think the AI Act proposal fails more spectacularly. Because if you do like a Google or whatever web browser you have, or a PDF browser for natural persons, start with that operation. Natural persons don't come a lot in the don't come up a lot in the in the in the AI Act text. But when they do, it's very important. And one is to say that actually to bring some clarity to something that many lawyers have passed on when uh, looking to the act proposal, which is the act proposal is purposely, so in, with a specific intention, an incomplete law. If you go to um, article uh, 57 of the, the AI Act, you see basically a norm saying the enforcement of the AI Act will be done through regulation 2019-1020, uh, which is the market surveillance regulation. And this is why if you look under the AI Act proposal for rules on how natural persons can exercise their rights against, for example, any breach of the duties that are foreseen in chapter two, you don't find any. And this is weird. Like if they have claim rights, if Offeld is right, they should have claim rights. Either we are determining wrongly the secondary addressees and they, the natural persons are not the secondary addressees. And I, I think they are for the reasons explained in the slide and I'm open to discussion. But if they are, then how can they exercise their claim rights, which is more or less what the Offeldian perspective uh, invites you to 
to inquire. And the answer is given by that regulation. And only in that provision, only when you get to Article 57, do you understand one thing, which is, I think, the most important, one of the most important things in the Act proposal, and it's awful that helped us understand this, which is the Act proposal is like an ancillary part of the market surveillance regulation. So AI systems are basically a product. Natural persons, as they are called in the AI Act proposal, are consumers for the purpose of the regulation. And so if you have a problem with the AI system, if, as a secondary addressee, as an holder of a claim right, you will not go to the AI Act only, you will go to the AI Act, and then you go to the regulation 2019-110, exercise your consumer rights and say, I have a claim right as a consumer, and the legal basis for that claim right is the duties that are being breached on the AI Act. I leave open the question for which I have absolutely no answer, which is, could legal persons, so companies, for example, also be the secondary addressees? Imagine that you are a legal company that is uh, using, or you are the manager of the legal entity, you are using an AI system, and there's damage to your company because you used it wrongly. Or so, for example, you go to the chat GPT, you ask something, ChatGPT tells you, you put that in the liberation of your company, the all thing goes to hell, and then you go, oh my God, but it was ChatGPT that told me to do this. It says it was lawful under my legal system. Then could the legal uh, person also be a secondary addressee to a claim right, of course, through the management bodies? I think he can, but I'm not sure on that. And to finish, I think this is the last one. It is, yeah, I spoiled it for you, but um, the last one is, just to the narrow sense of regulation. And here, again, I think it's modest, but I think it's helpful. One of the things is that uh, the powers that are foreseen that we can extract from um, the norms and the normative texts in the, in the AI Act proposal, they are, of course, addressed to national competent authorities. And so the liabilities that are mostly implicit as a, the euro correlative relation in the AI Act proposal uh, will help you to understand the discretion scope of the regulatory bodies. And that's very helpful to know the scope of the discretion that can be exercised. So I think it's a modest contribution, but again, an important one. And to finish, also they understand uh, how you, as a natural person, as a secondary addressee to the obligations, can exercise your legal uh, claim rights under um, or before the uh, bodies. And uh, asking forgiveness for the time I went on further. Thank you very much. And I'll leave you my email for comments later on. If you want. Thank you very much. They wouldn't wait long. You will talk again, I think, on Saturday. We will have the opportunity again to listen to you as well as your other colleagues. So um, thank you once again. Um, this was kind of very helpful to me in a way that uh, even though I've heard of Hoffeld, I've never ever occurred to me to, to use this perspective or maybe in a way you provided us with a useful instrument in, to understand this, as you said, the nightmare of an AI act. When I tried to read it, I just gave up. And I thought that it's kind of a thing that you should learn by heart when you need it but we definitely need it and it's our reality. So in a way, thank you for um, giving us a close, a close up to what the AI Act means, AI Act proposal, and of course, AI system, especially when it comes to primary and secondary addresses which we talked about. So now uh, I would like to ask the audience, meaning uh, in presence and online, if they have any questions for our lecturers. Okay, a presser, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. One is, how peculiar is this in terms of legislation in general? I mean, you were very critical about EU, EU legislation, but it seems to me that you take any piece of legislation and it's like that. And I wonder whether, <clears throat> in the specific case of the AI, that doesn't actually make sense. I mean, we want, uh, we don't know what's going to be like in five years' time. Perhaps we don't know even what it's going to be like in one year time. And uh, we want, so, a division of labor, a division of normative labor between various institutions. There are so many and so different and so, so many different levels. So you have European Parliament, then you have the European Commission, then you have 
you know, uh, European ports. I mean, not very many of those, but some. And then you have national institutions as well. And so you want to give a framework uh, which interacts sort of with existing law and then there's room for you know, specification, further specification by the grand courts. And of course, you have administrative agencies as well in, in between all that. So, yeah. Uh, and the second thing, I mean, it kind of like a further appearance or whatever, uh, whether the argument uh, proves too much in some sense. I mean, there is a sense in which we obviously want our legislation to be, to be as clear as possible and certainly also provide us with extremely clear and super simple uh, concepts and notions that you know seems to fit with our intuitions about law in a fundamental way. But if you then apply it to what law is, and it doesn't follow it, then that's too bad for awful. It's not too bad for law. We need something else to organize our thoughts in a simpler way. Okay. Uh, sorry, can I add to this? I have to leave, unfortunately. I have to teach on the EU. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a question, a, a, a bit of a follow up. Um, I would say not even bad for Fox, though. Uh, I, I follow up on what you've said. Because let us not forget that uh, Hochfeld devised this kind of heuristic framework uh, basically, basically for private law relations. So private law relations, either from torts or contracts, they create inter partes, very specific inter partes relations. When you try to move it to the public law framework, and especially to move it to the supranational public law framework, then you come up with, uh, with the, all sorts of difficulties that you uh, probably managed to do it very nicely. We, we could not see, but hopefully you can catch out what, you, what you've done in, in this, in this uh, uh, attempt. But, uh, I, I cannot uh, see the, that you can uh, blame as you did at the very uh, uh, last part of the of your talk uh, somehow to 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 blame the Hochfeldian either Hochfeldian framework or the uh, legislation itself for not matching uh, together. So that, I would say that 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 is the kind of the primary conceptual problem. Uh, that, that you have with, and of course, this is not the first uh, attempt of that sort. That there were a lot of criticism when Alexei wrote his, uh, constitution, uh, his theory of constitutional rights, where basically he was following the idea of making this kind, kind of dual relations uh, with, with fundamental freedoms. And again, it was a bit complex because it's very abstract. So you need a lot of individuation, general norms that individuate abstract freedoms or uh, uh, constitutional principles. And then you cannot immediately come with very strict uh, uh, dual relations who has the, who is on one side and who is on the other side. Madam, can I go for that? Do you want to answer the question by question or, or is it easier because aha, she has a follow up. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, doing it. Sorry. I'm, I'm taking notes from yeah. oh. on absolute rights and basically the both major analysis that I'm studying uh, comes from the Kofeldian model of claim rights. They start from the Kofeldian model of claim rights. But I wanted to uh, follow up with that because as I understand, if I understand correctly, the main problem is that you always have to have two persons and interrelation. And from the human rights perspective, the, the main difficulty is with dignity, for example, because then you cannot uh, con concretize the, uh, the, the other um, duty there, right? So that was uh, regarding the hospital in general. I have another a more practically oriented remark, but maybe that can be for later. Okay, so do I pick up more questions or I no. we have a better transfer now? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let me just 
right dot this. Okay, so uh, is it normal to find this level of, of complexity? I, I would say, well, it's contingent to the legal system you're talking about, but I would say, no. I mean, I, I, see, I think some topics and some legislator make it more complex than it should be by the topic itself. Uh, and uh, my answer is, uh, I have, it's completely empirical. You, I can come up with several examples where even moderately difficult topics are addressed by the legislator in a much more simpler way, thinking of, of legal positions and the uh, relation between the, the legal subjects. So I would say that we would not, I mean, it's not fate that uh, the AX is so complex. Um, do we want the complexity? I think we are talking about two different things. If you ask me, when we're talking about AI, should we have institutional complexity, regulatory complexity? Yes, uh, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm not defending EU bureaucracy, it's not that, but I understand that sometimes you want, for example, to have institutional redundancies, which for example, the AI does. You want to have something called the notifying body and some other thing called uh, called the competent authority because you have to have, for example, uh, prevention of uh, uh, conflicts of interest. So, okay, I understand that. And you can do that or that, I think, only goes on to show you that because you know that you are going to have inescapably uh, um, institutional complexity, then you should have put your focus on not having normative complexity and uh, legal positions as a... As a, as a uh, an added problem. So I think you should work on that. So that's that's something. Moving on to to your to your uh, remarks. On the, you know, actually, moving on to the two bad for awful remarks, which are uh, from the both of you. Um, I was not blaming awful. Uh, I was if I had so I was blaming uh, anyone. I was blaming the EU legislators. But I don't think actually I I, I worked. I'm working on where I I'm doing some work for some years on that. I think the Ophelian uh, approach, although it seems to, and this also addresses the last question, although it is, of course, it was sought out for private law, it presents no specific problems if you want to adapt it to public law. The only problem that uh, uh, allows you to, or that presents you, is that allows you or invites you to work with a plural subjective uh, network of uh, rural relationships. So, for example, let's uh, think of uh, the pair uh, duty uh, claim rights and privilege or liberty uh, liability. It seems like there are two, even often said that actually, or wrote that on that. It seems that there are two uh, distinct and autonomous uh, euro relationships, but under uh, public law, it's very common to have them both fused in a sense. So it's very common for you, for example, to have a claim right that actually, because the the norm of power is also a norm that uh, that the norm that uh, conveys a power is also a norm that uh, conveys an obligation. Because I didn't go into that, but it goes on to the problem of competency. What is competency? If it's a constitutive norm or a regulatory norm, if it's a permission or a duty. And if you go on to that, if you combine these two discussions, I think often works. Of course, you have to do that work, and I didn't do that here. So you're right. I I, I would catch on that later if the, the topic would come up, but I think you can do that work. I think uh, I think it's up to us, public lawyers, or anyone interested in public law, to do that. So that's not a problem. I think you can work with plural relationships of the kind of modernistic law deals with. Uh, and there was uh, one last. Well, I think I addressed. I think I addressed it. I, let me just say one last thing on the on the too bad for awful. What I think you have to do, coming back to the act to give an example on how I think you can do that, it's actually uh, on the last slide, I think, probably the one before that. Uh, actually, it's, uh, let me see, it's this one, I think. Is it working? Yeah, I think we will just need this. No, it stopped. Okay, um, so it's the slide before this one. But if you, for example, are a natural person in the DAEAC proposal and you think that uh, some duty has been breached by the, um, by the, uh, the provider, say. Um, okay, just to wrap up. There is no rule in the AI Act allowing you to exercise your claim right if I'm right, which is which is addressed to the natural person. You cannot exercise that right under a pure offending scheme regarding the provider. So that would make awful wrong in a, in a sense. 
uh, if I'm right and the secondary address is a natural person, the claim right would be something on the lines of what my colleague David Duarte says, uh, something that would not correspond to any deontic modality. So you would say, oh, he has a claim right, but what does it amount to? Nothing. He can't do anything with it. And if you look at the IAC, it seems like that. And I think mostly because of these public law questions. But then you have to understand that the claim right, you have to go get out of the IAC and go to the market surveillance regulation, basically gives you a right to complain as it does the GDPR, for instance, which is basically the models of branding of, of the, the EU legislator, gives you a right to present a complaint to the, um, the national supervisor. And when you exercise your claim right towards or through, not towards, but through the national authority, it activates the power to supervise the, the provider, which in, in due course will make him comply with the obligation which the secondary address. So you actually have here have a triangle, which is very common in remissive law, but you have to explain that and what I think is it's not very well thought out. And I, I didn't have the, uh, a chance to mention this, but I think there's at least, it seemed to me that this was uh, kind of, uh, um, lower was put lower in the in the importance of the the Ofeld contribution. I think, for example, it's very important if Ofeld did nothing else or Nofeldian approach did nothing else. Just the fact that you come up with this also uh, goes on to to your question. Did nothing else then, for example, allows you to uh, erase from the AI Act the redundant provisions. This will this will all will already amount to something that will help you to, to apply in the law. Because I am completely convinced that we'll have uh, endless discussions going up probably to the Court of Justice on where is a specific duty in the AIA? Is it on Article 17 or Article 16? And if it's on Article 17, why is the legislating saying something a little bit different but on the same object as the Article 16? And this will amount to endless discussions. And if I know big tech well, that's where they're going to explore the AIA. They're going to say, look, there's a rule saying this and a similar look, a rule saying that. This is all going to help. I'm going to uh, complain about the regulatory measures on uh, enforcing the AI Act. And I think it's something that is going to be bad on the enforcement part of the AI Act. So, yeah. Do you have any more comments? Yeah, so, uh, my first question would be, when the EU uh, uh, folks in the Lisbon public law write to the EU with your comments and suggestions, and then- uh, I'm Sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, so whether you or uh, people in the Lisbon public law okay. write to the EU with your comments and suggestions. Okay. And then the other one would be, isn't the nature of the EU law, uh, law making as such to be chaotic? And then the national assessment, uh, which is quite similar to uh, GDPR Act 35, uh, which, which you all talk about it, how different is that? And then, uh, well, I'm complex with the way states such as Germany and Netherlands violate our cherished rights, which is right to fair trial and right to privacy. Uh, because they, and then there are any number of cases where the digital right activists have pointed out that it's spent to policing or using AI in uh, welfare, you know, which most of the time tend to be in, in, inaccurate. Okay. And uh, as a human right activist, uh, to me, I would value Article 5, which bans uh, uh, facial recognition and then predictive policing. And uh, yeah, so uh, would you like to? But the, the last question, you say you favor the, the, the banning of the, the uh, what, is the, what is the question? Well, uh, so, uh, why, why do you find Article 5, uh, which to me, uh, or to me, any digital right activist, to be at the core oh, of the, core, the okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, why do you find that problem? Okay, yeah. Okay, you have one, you have a question. And then. Uh, yes. Let me just. For my yes. So yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, I actually I, I completely agree that this hotel and mile is very useful and can should be disagreed near uh, because it's not so much about the like whether it's more suited for the it's it's this thing where you from an interpretative standpoint, you kind of really figure out who the who the uh, right holder is, or, or the, who has the duty, or how the duty is split among two bodies. So he, he, even if you deviate dramatically from the Hoffelian uh, framework, we are doing kind of we are using the framework to try to disentangle uh, something that looks like a casting. 
Now, there are laws, of course, to the natural level that looks, look like hellscapes, but this is on another level, especially, yeah, this is my question, especially because this is the thing, well, now I was covering the internet about this while we were talking, and, and there is an article saying there are 150 startups in Europe, IE startups, and it's kind of, it's a very low number, actually, of IE startups having 150 startups, out of which there are maybe 100 in Great Britain, which is not really in the European Union or in the European Union. That, it would seem that with the level of complexity also, but also with this approach, which is a political approach, so I kind of don't want to waste time like stomping on the European Union on this. It's kind of they are they're doing a very good job of the idea in the sense that they're inventing the idea completely. Nobody, it doesn't seem that anybody wants to do it kind of after this. After this, and the people basically turn no on and say, So I didn't read the European Act, but I read the American Executive Board, which talks about the use of AI, potential uses of AI. Here, this part where of using healthcare, how to invest in order to make it work for those. Uh, goals that, that are actually worthwhile and that we already know that are worthwhile. Uh, so my question basically is kind of these regulative approaches and this level of complexity is, is it something to be disentangled or is it something that is for the European Union to be demolished if possible? Because it, it, will, it will just fix the European Union as a place where technology start to die Basically. <laughs> uh, okay. Can I insert a follow up? Yeah, of course, on this, and now we have three follow ups. One of the things that I was thinking about when you were speaking and you were also men uh, mentioning uh, Ron and Bulligan was this idea about the difference between master system and master book. And clearly, this act is a master book, but maybe the idea was because of the complexities of the political um, genesis of this, because you are like trying in a super level to come with a bunch of political views of states, which is not to be in a national parliament with a bunch of natural people's views about that. Maybe what we are trying is to accord in a master book for then any country within the European Union to come with their master system. And maybe that was also one of the goals of this. So I would just follow up uh, Boyan's question. But in this sense, what you're trying to suggest that they had to be even clearer, clearer, oh, sorry, clearer. more clear, yeah. let's say that, <laughs> in, a, in a very bad English, in the, um, um, when writing the master book, thinking about the possibility of every country having a different master system or every authority apply, trying to apply this having a different master system or what would be your like suggestion with this thanks yeah. you have uh, uh, has just a quick from my perspective the uh, one of the major issues is the fact that the act as the, 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 the last version is probably not in conformity with the eu charter uh, for fundamental rights with the two main concerns being the fact that you were mentioning the uh, the companies uh, that you have to do the conformity assessment. Well, yes, they will, as I understand, they will have to do uh, the self determination in terms of human rights harm. And that is unacceptable because that is unlike any other procedure where you have to have an external body monitoring the, the application. Another uh, concern, maybe even self unacceptable. That's unacceptable, yeah. Because company will say this is a high risk technology or this is a low risk technology without an external uh, verification. And um, uh, even bigger problem is the, um, the, 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 the proposed exception uh, 
regarding the AI systems that will be used for national security uh, purposes and migration or border control. So basically, whatever safeguards will be guaranteed, they will not be applied to the systems in these branches, and these are branches where the AI would be mostly used, probably, right? Like migration uh, uh, control and border. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Uh, no, I mean, I forgot to add. You have a follow up on your follow up. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so she can add that and we can answer. So I'm, well, I'm uh, just thinking uh, what is the alternative, you know, uh, to the existing uh, proposed AI act? You know, what is what an easy question to ask? No, <laughs> no, at least uh, the Algorithm uh, Accountability Act of 2022, the US Congress did not pass through, you know, it's going to the lobbyists. Uh, We've managed to, to write that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, in order, uh, sometimes do you write to the EU? We, we do, as a, as a research center, we do a lot of uh, in, uh, uh, papers on consultations either by national parliament or the EU. We have not done so in this, uh, in this case. Um, we are probably going to do it. Um, but I, I don't know when, uh, but probably, yeah. Then provoked chaos was the second. Uh, isn't this a provoked chaos? I, I wouldn't say so. I, this connects with something I, I'm going to elaborate more because it's a uh, buoyant question and uh, some other question. Um, I just think it has, basically has to do with something which is cultural more than legal, but I'll, I'll, I'll go to that. Uh, and connected with the problem of innovation, which is a was Boyer's first question. So uh, there's this saying that says that uh, the US innovates, uh, the China makes, and the European Union uh, regulates. And it's probably true. Uh, and uh, whenever people ask me, is it is it correct? It, well, it, it's, uh, it's not a legal problem. Uh, it's a cultural problem. What is your standard for um, regulating anything? Uh, before doing work on IA, I'm, I'm, I was mostly, I'm still doing work on the Digital Services Act, which is even, which is a, a little bit simpler than the AI Act, but it, it, for me, it poses uh, at least more day-to-day uh, -day problems because it regulates Facebook and Instagram. And there's nothing similar to the Digital Services Act in Europe. So basically the, the United States still has the 1998 uh, five uh, section 230 that says you're exempt from responsibility, so do whatever you want. And you can watch that from the transition from Twitter to X, for example. Uh, it's much more unregulated. And then you have Europe saying, with the commission saying, we're going to stop Twitter in Europe, they're doing bad things. So is it a legal problem? Of course not. It's a, a problem. It's only a legal problem in the sense that you have a normative authority in the United States and a normative authority in EU that are completely at odds with the kind of rules that should be enacted. So I, in a sense, I don't think it's provoked chaos. And if it is, and this connects to another, uh, and this connects to the question of provoked chaos, I think it's provoked chaos from the part of the lobbying did by big techs in Europe, and I'll go to that now. Is it something to be demolished? I didn't address the problem here because it's not on the first the, 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 the original proposal. It's actually what's making the AI Act not being approved as fast, which is this amazing thing that between the original proposal and today, uh, generative IA became a thing. So the legislator had not thought of that in 2021, and now there, there's a problem because generative IA is not in the AI Act. And people, of course, can be harmed by generative IA. Let me ask ChatGPT, what is the dose for this uh, sleeping pills? Uh, what's your, what your head, uh, weight? My weight is something. Oh, oh, of course, you can take three of those and you die. Well, uh, that's a problem because generative IA is not covered by the, 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 the original proposal of the AI Act. And I think, is it something to be demolished? Again, I know this is frustrating for an answer, but uh, if the current cultural framework of what you think regul regulation should be in Europe regarding anything digital. It starts in the data protection in GDPR, it goes on to online services in the Digital Services Act, and then it goes to AI. In the AI Act, I think it's going to be pretty much the same. So I think the problem is not of a legal order. And 
I, I think the only legal problem is the one I brought you here today, not being not so modest, which is when you have a certain amount of degree of rules, you accept that the, the normative authority has the right, as a, if it's a democratic body, to choose if he wants to complicate or not, and then you do whatever you do to try to uh, come to terms with the rules that you have. The question of the master book. It's, it also uh, uh, relates to this. Um, I don't think, definitely, I don't think for formal reasons that the EU is trying to create a master book for the, the member states to do their master systems. If it wanted to do that, it would approve, it would have uh, put forth a proposal for a directive and not for a regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I'm assuming everyone knows the, the distinction between, uh, to, between both under EU law. So, no, I don't think so. I think there's a, a, a step up in the in the demands that the European Union wants to make in this domain, and this is this is clear across the board. The GDPR is a, is a lot more regulatory than the the, the, the prior directive. Uh, the Digital Services Act doesn't even begin to compare with the modest e-commerce directive. And if you look at the the NIS two directive or the the, the cybersecurity directive, comparing to the the former one, now you have widened the scope of entities that are subject to the to the NIS two directive. So I would say that it's it's definitely a master book for master system. There's no leeway that member states can use. Of course, they can always use some leeway because there's national uh, legislation that enforces the, for example, I didn't talk about that either because it's not very Ophelian, uh, but for example, the fines, uh, the legislator uh, lets the, the, the national, uh, mem the, the, the national, the EU members decide on that. So, uh, just to answer the final question, and, and, and the, if some some things are not dealt with uh, under the AI Act, is that a problem? The, the, uh, for example, the, the idea of generative AI. Uh, no, actually, not the last question. The question of the charter. Sorry. Um, let's see. I, I don't think, and I, I forgot the, the Article Five, but I'm going to get there. Um, what the AI Act does is say, is to say that you have. You can exempt from the AI Act, for example, uh, I would say my, the, the, the topic of migration, but I would say that from a EU perspective, EU law perspective, you still have to comply with the charter. So the charter is hierarchical superior, so there, there's, there's not a problem. The, the question, of course, that you can uh, uh, counter, counter put to me is, well, but if uh, they're not going to get regulated to the AI Act, what are, going, uh, what are they going to apply? It's the glass half uh, empty or half full, because you can say it's worse for a public institution to not have the AI Act. Because if you don't have the AI Act and you want to uh, use some sort of uh, AI system, for example, in the migration domain, what will you use to regulate it? You, you use directly the charter, which will put you before a very difficult balancing operation. And if it goes to court, the court will probably decide on the side of the migrants and not on the side of the enforcement bodies. But this is me doing uh, uh, future predictions, so of course, uh, I don't know. And uh, Article 5, I mean, uh, again, Article 5 is just the tip of the iceberg of the cultural option. So basically what we're saying in the EU is we think that uh, the only things that, actually it's the counter question to Boyan's, uh, to Boyan's concern. So uh, again, it's uh, the, the, the metaphor of the glass is useful. Should we have, because I think you were pointing out towards that, should we have more IA in Article 5? I think you would like that. Uh, no. So no? I'm quite satisfied with okay. what we have uh, in Article 5, because if you look at the United States as such, okay. so we do not have uh, an explicit law that prohibits uh, predictive policy, okay. uh, which, when applied, has is quite inaccurate in uh, targeting uh, in, 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 and it's, it's responsible for incarcerating uh, minorities and low-income uh, people uh, in Europe. But even if you look at uh, the art, such tools in Netherlands and in Germany, they prove to be quite inaccurate uh, in targeting uh, ethnic uh, ethnic groups uh, in Netherlands. Yeah. So, okay. But so Article, uh, article Five uh, explicitly bans predictive policy. That's quite uh, okay. Uh, no, I think that that goes to the. I, I mean, I think Article Article Five. Uh, the only uh, perspective that you could use to uh, to try to do some scrutiny on Article 5 would be the charter to say that is it only a political option or should we have something in Article 5 that would come out as a, a legal consequence of a relationship be between the AI Act and the, the charter. 
Uh, it's difficult to say that the, the charter mandates some sort of uh, AI system to be forbidden. I think what all of us can say is that the degree of risk posed by AI systems, at least that we know of, is will be in some instances incompatible with uh, with the charter. But then that's what chapter two of the AI Act is all about, is making high risk systems. So where the question that you're posing is, when do we go from high risk systems that can still be regulated and by that you aim to comply with the charter, that you go to a point where you say the only way to comply with the charter is by not allowing them at all. So there's the regulation is a prohibition and that that's satisfied. That's a question I don't know how to answer because I think, and I think no lawyer can answer. I mean, I think we can do the balancing once we have empirical evidence of the risk that is posed. And I think that we don't have, know that exactly. That, that I think the generative IA shows that uh, a lot. Generative IA, the reason why there's uh, actually very few good papers on that, the reason why it was not put on or put on the, it, it's because it was not specific enough. That shows that the U.S. legislature was very focused on targeting specific uses and never it, it never occurred to the legislator, but generic uses are the worst because that means that anyone can use that that kind of IA. I mean, if you're looking for, for example, the, the case that you that you gave that example to, for example, facial screening, facial monitoring. Of course, most people are not in their day-to-day -day lives are not put before uh, uh, facial screenings. So of course, it's a problem and it, when it happens, it's, uh, it's uh, a very, difficult and delicate problem from a fundamental rights perspective, but that's not what happens most days. Most days, kids, uh, old people, we uh, just go to chat GPT and make, a, make, make questions. And if chat GPT goes or gives you the wrong answer, that may induce some harm. You either destroy property or you cause yourself or uh, others harm. And that's the real problem of the area, which is unfortunately something I didn't address at all today because I have no answer on how to address that. But I think that that's a basically a technical problem. Okay. Well, I think we explored our time. Even though it's always great to have a good discussion afterwards, it means it means that the lecture sparks an interesting topic as it could be. So I would like to thank everyone. I think we had the thing here with the camera that the camera was always pointed at Professor <laughs> Domingo Farinho and myself. But here with us in the room, we had a lot of guests who asked some interesting questions, and I would like to thank them all, not only PhD students, but our professors and other colleagues. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you for interesting questions. And thank you, Professor Farinho, for your participants and for your lecture. We will have opportunity to hear from you again in two days. Thank you very much. Thank you.